Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching History of Russia Part 2. So, in Part 1, we witnessed the rise and fall of the Rurikid dynasty, uh, ending during the Time of Troubles in the early 1600s, a time of great chaos when it seemed like the Russian state might entirely collapse. Uh, I guess we're going to see what happened with that in this video. I'm excited to get into this one. If you guys end up enjoying this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. History of Russia, Part 2. In 1612, Russia was in a state of anarchy. Mm. They called it the Time of Troubles. The people were terrorized by war. Fam it was almost complete anarchy. And as we talked about last time, you know, I mentioned that Poland-Lithuania was a big competitor of Russia at the time, uh, throughout this entire time period, in fact. And this was the point at which it looked like Russia might entirely collapse and Poland-Lithuania might take over most of their land. They would become the powerhouse of the region. Now, of course, that isn't what happened, but... You know, you could be forgiven, you know, thinking that at this point, there was such complete anarchy in Russia itself. Famine and plague. Up to a third of them perished. Holy. Foreign troops occupied Moscow, Smolensk, and Novgorod. Yep. But then, Russia fought back. Prince Pozharsky and a merchant, Kuzma Minin, led the Russian militia to Moscow and threw out the Polish garrison. Since 2005, this event has been commemorated every 4th of November as Russian National Unity Day. Hmm. Uh, there's Putin. Um, I mean, look, it is a pretty big day for Russian history, but, you know, with this mention of sort of modern politics and, you know, this video of Putin, it is worth remembering um, particularly, I mean, with a lot of countries' history, but particularly countries like Russia, um, you know, a lot of modern politicians sort of use history for their own purposes, uh, oftentimes just nefariously. I mean, Putin's a great example of that. He tried to use history to justify his, frankly, unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you know, he's one of these authoritarian strongmen that really relies on a strong sense of nationalism and history to sort of bolster his legitimacy. Um, you know, history is very important. It's really important to study, um, but it should not be misconstrued. And I always hate seeing history being kicked around uh, as like a political football. Um, you know, I think it should be studied for its own sake, not used for, um, you know, these political goals, uh, whichever way you look at it. But like I said, uh, a lot of countries, say with authoritarian leaders or... Uh, regimes of that sort really like to use history, um, you know, particularly, say, medieval history to sort of look back on their country's golden age and, and justify whatever authoritarian actions they're taking right now. Um, so th that's just what came to my mind, seeing these videos of Putin associated with the study of Russian history. Ah, uh, the Romanovs. You know, it's pretty... I mean, Russia had basically two dynasties, the Rurikids and the Romanovs. It's pretty remarkable for the length of uh, time the country was around that they didn't have, you know, more royal dynasties swapping in and out. It's a pretty impressive amount uh, of stability. Um, well, there was a lot of instability within those time periods. Don't get me long. Don't get me wrong. But having such a long-reigning dynasty in itself is pretty impressive. Um, and, of course, the Romanovs would reign until the end of Imperial Russia, but, you know, we're going to see all of that throughout this series. The Russian Assembly, the Zemsky Sabor, realized the country had to unite behind a new ruler and elected a 16-year-old noble, Mikhail Romanov, mm. as the next Tsar. His dynasty would rule Russia for the next 300 years. Yep. Tsar Mikhail exchanged territory for peace. 
they probably could have never imagined that uh, this young prince would create such a long-lasting dynasty. Uh, and probably one of the reasons it was so long-lasting compared to other dynasties was uh, the level of authority that the Romanov czars held. I mean, the Russian czars governed as true authoritarians. I mean, I don't think absolute power is a real thing. No one has ever wielded absolute power. But the Russian czars got as close as you could to wielding absolute power. Uh, I mean, throughout Europe, we have these absolute monarchs of this era, like, say, Louis XIV. But even Louis XIV had to rely on other people to get stuff done. Uh, and he was one of the more powerful of these absolute monarchs. A lot of other monarchs were very reliant on their nobles to achieve their goals. The Russian czars were probably the best at, you know, crushing opposition uh, and making their nobles work for them, not the other way around. Winning Russia much needed breathing space. His son, Tsar Alexei, implemented a new legal code, the Sabornoya Ulugenya. Mm. It turned all Russian peasants, 80% of the population, into serfs. And see, this is sort of Russia moving through time, but they're so far behind that, you know, they've now reached serfdom in the mid 1600s. When, uh, at this period, a lot of European countries have had serfdom for a while, and in the next hundred years, they will start to get rid of it. But in 1649, Russia is only now instituting official serfdom. So they're late to the party, and they will be one of, if not the last country, to officially abolish serfdom in Europe. Effectively slaves. Yes, and for those that don't know, serfdom is pretty similar to slavery. It's a system in which... The peasants are bound to the land. They can be the land can be bought and sold, and as the land is bought and sold, the peasants who work the land are bought and sold with it. And the peasants are usually not allowed to leave that land. They're forced to stay there and work the land for their entire lives. And you know this applies to their children and their children's children, etc., etc. Their status inherited by their children, right? With yeah. no freedom to travel or choose their master. I mean, yeah, they're explaining exactly what I did. It was a system that dominated Russian rural life for the next 200 years. Yeah. It was abolished in the mid-1800s. Uh, around the same time America abolished slavery. Um, and, uh, you know, around that time, serfdom was very much out of style. Um, a lot of European countries had had major pushes for abolition in the late 17, early... Well, it had been going for a while, but... Late 1700s, early 1800s, as Europe started to move past feudalism, they also abolished serfdom. Like I said, Russia was late to serfdom in the first place. A lot of countries, you know, were coming to the tail end of their system of serfdom by the time Russia adopted it, and so they were very late in abolishing it. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Nikon, imposed religious reforms that split the church between reformers and old believers. Yep. It's a schism that continues to this day. Yeah, I mean, old believers, um, you know, they have remained as a dissenting group, uh, like they said, until this very day. Ukrainian Cossacks, rebelling against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, recognized Tsar Alexei as overlord in exchange for his military support. It led to the Thirteen Years' War between Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And the Cossacks, you know, they were always sort of an independent group, uh, an autonomous people, so they only accepted the Tsar as overlord because they felt, uh, you know, it, it was a way to get out of domination by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. They didn't want to be ruled by Russia either, but they were basically, at the time, choosing the option that would give them the most autonomy. Um, now, of course, in the long term, Russia would become a very powerful authoritarian imperial empire. But, you know, of course, they're working on the information they have in 1660, or the war started in 1654, uh, ended in 1667. So, this is, uh, you know, what they're working on. Russia emerged victorious, reclaiming Smolensk and taking control of eastern Ukraine. 
a revolt against Tsarist government, led by a renegade Cossack, Stenka Razin, hmm. brought anarchy to southern Russia. Hmm. It was finally suppressed. Raz You'll see throughout Russian history, the Cossacks, if there's a revolt going on, the Cossacks will often have something to do with it. Um, I mean, they're skilled warriors, skilled horsemen uh, with uh, independent spirit. So if there's a revolt going on, you're going to find some Cossacks involved. Azin was brought to Moscow and executed by quartering. Ugh. The sickly but highly educated Fyodor III passed many reforms. He abolished Mesnichestva, the system that had awarded government posts according to nobility rather than merit, and hmm. symbolically burned the ancient books of rank. Wow. But Fyodor died aged just 19. His sister Sophia became princess regent, ruling on behalf of her younger brothers, the joint Tsars Ivan V and Peter I. After centuries of conflict, Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth signed a Treaty of Eternal Peace. Ha! <laughs> Treaty... <laughs> There have been many examples of treaties of eternal peace throughout history. Uh, I'm thinking of the ones signed by the Romans and the Persians. Um, but there are many ex examples of these. And uh, if you couldn't already tell, a treaty of eternal peace has never, ever been a treaty of eternal peace. <laughs> uh, I like the optimism, though. I was also thinking, you know, it's uh, 1686 when this happens. It is remarkable to think that in a little more than a hundred years from that point, Poland will no longer exist. In the late 1700s, Poland's territory will be completely taken over by its neighbors, and the independent country of Poland will be gone. It's gone, it really goes from such a major power in the region to not a power at all in a relatively short period of time. Um, of course, that's due to the geopolitics of the region, the expanding Russia, the rising Prussia, but I'm sure we will get to some of that later on. It is just a remarkable thing to mention right now. Russia then joined the Holy League mm. in its war against the Ottoman Empire. This is also, you know, the Ottomans have sort of reached the extent of their power at this point, I would say. And from this point onwards, through the 17 and 1800s, uh, the Ottoman Empire will enter a period of serious decline. They'll have some W's, sort of in the early 1700s, but overall, uh, it's really going downwards for them. Sophia's reign also saw the first treaty between Russia and China, establishing the frontier between the two states. Wow. Ah, here we go. One of the most important figures in Russian history. At age 17, Peter I seized power from his half-sister, Sophia. I will also say, this is not the portrait of Peter that is most famous, but what you already might notice is that, compare his portrait to those of his predecessors. His predecessors have all been dressed in sort of Russian, Orthodox, traditional garb. Peter, you know, he already looks very Western in his dress in this portrait, uh, and, you know, all the images we're going to see of him uh, are probably going to be very westernized. Um, that very much plays into his legacy, which we're going to see as they talk about him. Peter became the first Russian ruler to travel abroad. Mm -hmm. He toured Europe with his grand embassy, seeking allies for Russia's war against Turkey. And He did it kind of undercover, by the way. He did not let on that he was Peter the Great. Uh, you know, he traveled seeking for allies and also learning as he traveled throughout Europe because he felt like Russia had a lot to learn from the West. Um, yeah. Learning the latest developments in science and yep. shipbuilding. The war against Turkey was... So Although I will say, you know, Peter was not an inconspicuous figure, so I, I wouldn't be surprised. He, he was sort of trying to go incognito, but I wouldn't be surprised if many of the people he encountered knew it was him. He was a massive guy. You have this massive Russian guy with this big entourage. You know, I'm sure people probably knew, like, oh yeah, that that's Peter. He's pretty recognizable. Um, but the goal was not necessarily to travel as the Tsar, but it was to travel 
uh, and research, see the latest science, the latest shipbuilding techniques, make allies. So yeah. Successfully concluded by the Treaty of Constantinople, Russia gained Azov from Turkey's ally, mm. the Crimean Khanate, and with it, a foothold on the Black Sea. Peter made. We talked about earlier how, um, you know, Russia has some access to the sea right now, but they have access to port cities that are frozen for most of the year. So Russia is on this relentless crusade to get more port cities, more uh, port cities that are not frozen over for most of the year, so that they can trade year-round. Getting a port on the Black Sea is definitely good for them. Um, of course, that is sort of an enclosed environment, so uh, and also it's controlled largely at this point by the Ottomans. Now, that will change over time. Um, but Russia's still on this crusade to get more port cities that allow for year-long trade. Made many reforms, seeking to turn Russia into a modern European state. Yep. He demanded Russian nobles dress and behave like Europeans. He made those who refused to shave pay a beard tax. Yeah, Peter is sort of a, an interesting fellow. He's very inspired by the West, by the rest of Europe. Uh, he's sort of one of these uh, enlightened despots, though highlight the despot part. Um, you know, he doesn't really fit with the mold of enlightened despot, I suppose. He wasn't necessarily following uh, the lead of the Enlightenment, but he was sort of a, I don't know what you want to call it, a progressive despot, a reforming absolutist. Um, you know, he took reforms from the Western world, um, which, you know, were not in use in Russia, uh, and he you know, made them happen with an iron fist. Things like forcing his nobles to dress as Europeans and forcing uh, Russian men to shave their beards to make them appear more Western. His court adopted Western customs, and he forced all of this. This sort of ties back to what I was saying about how the Russian czars had a lot of power over their nobility. Uh, unlike a lot of other uh, monarchs throughout Europe, there were really very few institutions that could check the Tsar's power. The Russian Tsar could basically do whatever they wanted. Um, you know, Peter could pass any decree he wanted, whatever he said was law, uh, and his nobles really had no effective way to resist him. So he got what he wanted. They, If they wanted something, they had to go to him. This wasn't like some other systems where, you know, the king uh, sort of had to go to his nobles to get stuff done, or was, say, responsive to a parliament or some other council. Wasn't like that. Peter built the first Russian navy, reformed the army and government, mm -hmm. and promoted industry, trade, and education. In the Great Northern War, Russia, Poland, Lithuania, and Denmark took on the dominant power in the Baltic, Sweden. Yeah, this was, I'd say, one of Sweden's sort of last hurrahs. Sweden was a very prominent power before this, um, which might sound surprising to many of you today, given that Sweden uh, is not a massive player on the world stage. But at this point, they were a pretty important regional power. Uh, I'd say this was sort of their last show of force um, before that power went into serious decline. The war began badly for Russia, with a disastrous mm. defeat to Charles XII of Sweden at Narva. But Pretty famous figure right there. Uh, Charles was a very interesting leader. Russia won a second battle of Narva, before crushing Charles XII's army at the Battle of Poltava. On the Baltic coast, Peter completed construction of a new capital. St. Petersburg. Yep. The building of what would become Russia's second largest city among coastal marshes was a remarkable achievement. It's very, I see it as something very similar to Versailles, um, though perhaps even more impressive. You know, Versailles was the project uh, of Louis XIV, uh, and it was, you know, an effort to bring his nobility to him so he could have control over them. And it worked. I mean, he was very effective in that. Peter is basically doing a similar thing, except he's trying to build an entire city 
a new capital. He wants to, you know, get away from the traditional bases of noble power in Russia, get away from Russian traditions, and build this new modern European city, um, which he does. You know, he builds his own, his very own modern capital. Um, and, you know, very much like Louis, he sort of forces his nobles to come to him uh, and live the European way like, like he wants. Um, you know, it's sort of an interesting look at how state power uh, and architecture uh, and city planning can be used to sort of enforce the power of the monarch. Though it cost the lives of many thousands of serfs. Yeah, brutal, brutal building process. I mean, like they said, built in like swamps and marshes. Um, it was really not uh, a great place to build it, uh, at least based on that. So it was a really difficult process. Um, but through the lives of many serfs, he, he managed to do it. The Great Northern War ended with the Treaty of Neustadt. Russia's gains at Sweden's expense made it the new dominant Baltic power. Mm -hmm. Four years before his death, Peter was declared Peter the Great, father of his country, emperor of all the Russias. Yeah, I mean, Peter is truly one of the greatest leaders that Russia ever saw. Uh, now, of course, he's a complicated figure. He um, exemplifies the westernizing spirit that many Russian czars have had. Um, but he also exemplifies that famous authoritarianism that Russian leaders always seem to have. Uh, whether it be the czars, the leaders of the USSR, or modern Russian leaders like Vladimir Putin, um, you know, he was uh, a modernizing reformist, but he did not introduce uh, any semblance of democracy. He did not devolve powers to a parliament or to anybody else. He kept all the power for himself. He was an autocrat. But he used that power to modernize and westernize. So he's sort of a complex but extremely important figure in Russian history. Uh, and we will see more of that westernizing in the future, though obviously a lot of the nobles weren't super happy uh, at Peter's westernizing innovations. They wanted to stay Russian. They didn't want to adopt these European customs. And so a debate will emerge over time between Russophiles uh, and westernizers, you know or you can call them Slavophiles and Westernizers, there's different terms, but those who want to move Russia more towards the Western world, towards Europe, and those who want more of a unique Russian identity based on, uh, you know, Russian customs, Russian traditions, and a unique Russian political system. Peter was succeeded by his wife, Catherine. Then his grandson, Peter II, who died. And as, as you'll notice, now, from Peter on, uh, we have very westernized portraits of the monarchs. Just one of the many changes. Died of smallpox, aged just 14. Empress Anna Yanavna, daughter of Peter the Great's half-brother, Ivan V, was famed for her decadence and the mm. influence of her German lover, Ernst Biron. Uh-oh. During Anna's reign, Vitus Bering, a Danish explorer in Russian service, led the first expedition to chart the coast of Alaska. He also discovered the Aleutian Islands, and later gave his name to the sea that separates Russia and America. I didn't know that the fella uh, was Danish, Dane in Russian service, how about that? But yeah, the Bering Strait, uh, I suppose that was named after him. After Anna's death, her infant grandnephew Ivan VI was deposed by Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth. Hmm. Ivan VI spent his entire life in captivity. Damn. Until age 23, he was murdered by his guards during a failed rescue attempt. Ooh. I mean, that's what happens when you have these uh, dynastic systems of succession. Um, you know, unlike a modern democratic system where we elect the next ruler, in a system like this, you know, uh, if you have a competitor to the throne who has some level of legitimacy, 
you're probably gonna lock them up for their entire lives, or if you want the security, just murder them. Elizabeth, meanwhile, was famed for her vanity, extravagance, and many young lovers. Hmm, it seems like we've had a couple of, you know, perhaps average to bad monarchs here. But she was also capable of decisive leadership in alliance with okay. France and Austria. I mean, Elizabeth also did rule for, you know, looking at the numbers, 21 years, so seems like she may have been more capable than the others. I don't have too much to say uh, on, you know, the four empresses on this time period. Uh, I feel like it's sort of understudied compared to what came before and what came after. I mean, they're sort of bookended by two great leaders, two greats in Russian history. So I feel like this period in Russian history is sort of, uh, you know, understudied a little bit. Elizabeth led Russia into the Seven Years' War against Frederick the Great of Prussia. Mm. The Russian army inflicted a crushing defeat on Frederick yeah. at the Battle of Kunersdorf. Yeah, Russia was performing very well. But failed to exploit its victory. Meanwhile, in St. Petersburg, the Winter Palace was completed at vast expense. It would remain the monarch's official residence right up until the Russian Revolution. Yeah, you know, I was saying how St. Petersburg is sort of uh, Peter's version of Versailles. And I mean, here's the Winter Palace. Uh, there's the direct equivalent. Of 1917. Peter III was Peter the Great's grandson by his elder daughter, Anna Petrovna. Uh, yeah, he... Well, I've got a lot to say about Peter III. He was, uh, you know did not live up to uh, Peter the Great. And also we're seeing, we already saw some German influence. We're seeing even more German influence over the Russian uh, nobility and monarchy here. Peter's an interesting figure. Who died as a consequence of childbirth. Raised in Denmark, Peter spoke hardly any Russian yeah. and greatly admired Russia's enemy, Frederick the Great. Yep, he, he, he was a fanboy. He was a Frederick the Great fanboy. He loved him. So he had Russia swap sides in the Seven Years' War, saving Frederick from almost certain defeat. That's what I was... So, <laughs> Russia was doing well in this war until Peter switched sides um, because of his love of Frederick. This was a very stupid decision. Um, you know, he... Peter basically wasted several years of Russian military effort it was also a very unpopular decision amongst the Russian court um, because, you know, the Russian nobility looked at this Peter guy who had been raised in Denmark and, you know, he was very German. Uh, he loved Frederick, uh, you know, the ruler of Prussia, and he'd made this stupid decision and they were saying, this guy is not even ruling on behalf of Russia. You know, wh what is he doing? So people were very much not pleased with Peter. Peter's actions angered many army officers, and he'd always been despised by his German wife, Catherine. Yeah, another German. You were seeing the German influence, but uniquely, uh, Catherine was a German, but, you know, she was a very talented uh, and intelligent woman. When she was married to Peter and moved to Russia, she really embraced the local culture. She embraced Russian traditions. She embraced uh, Orthodox Christianity. You know, she really russified. You know, she really, um, you know, acclimatized the local culture. And she made herself very popular around court. Uh, and she was, you know, in direct contrast to her husband, who, you know, they saw as very Germanized and he was very immature and he wasn't making the decisions that he should have been making. She seemed, even though she was German, she seemed very Russian. She was intelligent. She was mature. So she presented a very clear contrast to her sort of bumbling husband. Together, they deposed Peter III. Yep. Who died a week later in suspicious circumstances. Yeah, very suspicious. You know, it's... I don't know if, you know, Catherine ordered Peter's execution, but I think it might have been one of those situations where... You know, she didn't give the orders, but it was pretty clear that it would be good for her if Peter was assassinated. And then, you know, some fellas took the initiative, killed him, and she, you know, didn't punish them, basically. I think it was probably one of those situations, though of course it could have been a coincidental death that is possible. 
His wife, Catherine, became Empress of Russia. Her reign would be remembered as one of Russia's most glorious. The next great, that's when I said that this sort of era of four empresses was bookended by two greats, Peter and Catherine. Ah, there we go. Epic History TV depends on donations from its fans. Very, I mean, this video is pretty old, but yeah, go and show them some support. Um, I, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, I've enjoyed this series so far because, you know, we get a general look at Russian history, and I feel like I have a lot to share. Uh, I can, you know, add a lot to these videos. Uh, and like I said, Russian history is really quite fascinating to me. Um, you know, I, I think the whole... Uh, westernizer versus russophile or slavophile debate is really interesting and where we situate russia in european history and in global history uh, also of course it's such an important uh global power and it has been for hundreds of years i mean we saw peter building russia up to an important power uh, and that will continue under catherine and her predecessors uh, or her successors sorry so yeah, I've been enjoying this series. Uh, if you guys have, please leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today. I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.